Please stand. We come together this morning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin now in the presence of God and of one another. We keep this time of silent prayer as we open our hearts and our lives to the God of all grace and mercy. Let's pray together. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us and for his sake, God forgives us all our sin. As a called and ordained minister in the Church of Christ by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. 
In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for the peace from above and for our salvation. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, Comfort and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. This is the feast of victory for our God. Hallelujah. Worthy is Christ, the Lamb. Let's pray. Generous God, your son gave his life that we might come to peace with you. Give us a share of your spirit. And in all we do, empower us to bear the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Well, good morning. Everybody recovered from last night? Okay, I'm very worried about you. <laughs> if you don't know what I mean, then bless you, I guess, right? <laughs> anyway, good morning. It's good to see you all. Beautiful morning this morning. Good morning to folks uh, who are watching on the stream as well. Good morning, boys and girls who are watching from home. A uh, couple of things uh, for our families with uh, young children. Uh, this morning, uh, we will have a Sunday school lesson posted on the Facebook page and the, I believe on the church website as well at 1030. Starting next Sunday, uh, we've talked with some of our, our parents and our families and, and uh, given that, that children's vaccin vaccinations are not rolling out yet, uh, there's some hesitancy yet to start live Sunday school among many of our families. So we're going to do live Zoom Sunday school starting next Sunday. Uh, and that'll probably be about 10.45, the last 20, 30 minutes. Uh, that information will be coming out in all of the usual ways this week. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, and please join um, Kylie and Naomi and, and all of the folks. We'll have, some, we'll have some fun together with that. So watch out for that. 
So, um, so here's a question. Um, how many remember building pillow forts at home? Or did you call them blanket forts? Maybe you called them blanket forts, right? How many remember doing that when you, right? That was so much fun. We always kind of loved doing that. Uh, I'm guessing that that's still a very common thing uh, for kids to do uh, at home, a fun thing to do, uh, to, especially like on a rainy day maybe or on a cold day, something uh, kind of fun to do. Um, this past week, um, some of our neighbors have been celebrating uh, a, a special festival for them called Sukkot. And in that festival, one of the things that they do, our, our uh, Jewish friends, uh, they do is they um, build these little booths, these little tents inside their house, and that's where they eat their meals. Because it is a remembering, it's a festival that remembers the time uh, when the Israelites, after they had come out of slavery, traveled for 40 years in the wilderness, and they lived in tents. And so they do this to remember that time, to remember their very humble roots that they come from, this, this time when they wandered in the desert and they were completely at um, the mercy of God to provide for them the food that they needed and the water and the shelter and it's a way of remembering that, that we do, in the end, always depend on God for all the good things that we have. Sometimes we forget that. Sometimes we think that we just do whatever we want to do, and we forget how important God is to us and all the good things that God does for us. And so it would be kind of fun. I wish that we also celebrated that festival of, called the Festival of the Booths. And, and took some time out of our life to remember what it's like to need God all the time. I think that would keep us closer to him. Part of what's fun about this festival, or I think interesting anyway, about this time, is it's also a harvest festival. So it's also a time when they're being very thankful for all of the bounty of the earth, all of the things that grow and all of the crops coming in. And we're pretty close to harvest time uh, here in our neighborhood as well. It's such an important time, right? Because if there's not a good harvest, it doesn't just affect the farmers, it affects all of us, right? Our whole uh, community is sort of dependent on there being good harvests. And, and while farmers do smart things to get good harvests, in the end, the farmers also depend on God for good weather and good conditions so that the crops can grow and so that there can be a good harvest. It's a good reminder to us of how important it is, one, to remember that we depend on God all the time, and two, how wonderful God is that as much as we depend on him, he always provides and cares for us. In every difficult time, whenever we're afraid, we know that God is always watching over us and that he will bring us everything that we need. Have a great Sunday. Uh, it's nice to have you with us this morning. We will continue with the reading of the lessons.
are too heavy for me. If this is the way you are going to treat me, put me to death at once. If I have found favor in your sight, and do not let me see my misery. So the Lord said to Moses, Gather for me seventy of the elders of the Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and the officers over them. Bring them to the tent of the meeting and have them take their place there with you. So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord. And he gathered 70 elders of the people and placed them all around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. And when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied. But they did not do so again. Two men remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the other Medad, and the spirit rested on them. They were among those registered, but they had not gone out to the tent. And so they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, son of Nun, the assistant of Moses, one of his chosen men said, My Lord Moses, stop them. But Moses said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put this put his spirit on them? The word of the Lord. We will read responsibly Psalm 19. The teaching of the Lord is perfect and revives the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure and gives wisdom to the simple. The fear of the Lord is clean and endures forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. By them also is your servant enlightened, and in keeping them there is a great reward. Above all, keep your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not get dominion over me. Then shall I be whole and sound and innocent of a great offense. The second reading is from the fifth letter to, of James. Are any among you suffering? They should pray. Are any cheerful? They should sing songs of praise. Are any among you sick? They should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise them up, and anyone who has committed sins will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another, and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being like us, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth yielded its harvest. My brothers and sisters, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and is brought back by another, you should know that whoever brings that sinner back from wandering will save the sinner's soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand. The Holy Gospel this morning from the Gospel of St. Matthew, the ninth chapter. John said to Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. 
But Jesus said, do not stop him. For no one who does a deed of power in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. Whoever is not against us is for us. For truly, I tell you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you bear the name of Christ will by no means lose the reward. If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and go to hell, the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out. For it is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and to be thrown into hell, where the worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its saltiness, how can you season it? Have salt in yourself. Be at peace with one another. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Let's pray. Gracious and Holy Father, we in all our days seek refuge in your word, seek help in your teachings, seek hope in uh, your commandments. Help us to know your word, help us to live it fully and truly, help us to um, be a peace that we might be salt for the earth. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so, so raise hands with me uh, if you think life is harder now than it uh, was when you were little. Not, not harder because you're older now and you have more responsibilities and you used to be a child and not have to worry about things, but like harder now because the world is actually more difficult, more complicated, more, you kind of, not a, maybe, right? I mean, I, I was thinking about that question this week, and I, you know, I was trying to, to decide. I mean, part of it is, you know, life changes, the world changes. Uh, we know more than we knew a generation or two ago, and, and of course, you know, part of the nature, the way that we deal with the world is we have sort of a preconceived notions of how things are to be uh, that we use to sort things out and help us understand, and that works really well until we learn more and, and those notions kind of fall apart on us, and then we have to figure out how to deal with uh, the fact that the world is always more complicated than we think that it is. But part of it may be technology, right? Technology makes life a little bit more difficult because it seems like there's always more stuff that you gotta sort your way through or, or, or navigate your way through. But, but at the end, I came to the conclusion that, that life is really not any different than it was a generation ago or a generation before that, that the basic truths of life are always the same. There's always hardship. There's always pain and suffering. There, there's always technology, right? Technology is constantly changing. You know, we didn't have the internet a generation ago, but we, we barely had telephones a generation ago. And you go a generation before that, we didn't even have cars. I mean, think of, 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 of all of the things that are new, just even in the last century, in the last four generations. And it's always changing. Those things are always different, always challenging. But the basic truths of life never change. Right, I mean, the basic things of life are always the same. I mean, we're always still human beings. The, we're always still trying to find ways to live together in community. Maybe harder now because there are more of us in smaller spaces, but still learning to live together in peace and harmony has always been hard. Right, making our way, providing for ourselves, all those basic questions have always been the same, and the challenges have always been the same, too. 
There has always been greed and corruption. There has always been violence. There has always been um, uh, human brokenness. It is the nature of us, and that has never changed. Which means then, I think, that there are also truths, answers to questions that are also always the same that there are certain unchangeable laws and truths that have always been there for us. And if we could somehow stay true to those things, somehow stay rooted in those basic truths, we would always have answers to whatever questions came our way. I, I hear all the time, and I, I'm sure you do too, that, that part of the problem with the world today is that somehow we have lost God. And if we could just get God back in the world today, then we could solve all of these problems and we could all be happy and everything would be good. Of course, I believe that. <laughs> Except that we make that sound so simple. A a as if we could just flip on a switch and bring God back into the world and then psh, everything would go away. Or as if somehow we were the ones who took God out of the world, as if we had that power and ability to do that. Ha ha ha. Right? But we have his word. Right? At the heart of this conversation, it's this thing, is this promise, is this reality that we have and have always had God's word. And everything we ever needed to know and everything we will always ever need to know has always been available to us and always will be. In the end, life is just that simple, sort of. In the end, it's just simply a matter of what the psalmist said for us this morning. The teaching of the Lord is perfect. It's right there. Everything we need to know is right there in the word of God. If only just we knew it. If only just we listened. If only just we paid attention. If only just we practiced what we preached. The problem is, is that we have not a clue. And it seems sometimes that we're getting farther and farther away from actually knowing what the word of the Lord is. I, I, I'm amazed constantly. I'm fairly active on social media, at least on, on Facebook, in a couple of different ways. Uh, and, and one of the difficulties of being a pastor uh, in social media is that people are always quoting the Bible back at you. Like, I, excuse me, I, I kind of know the Bible. I've been doing this for a little while. But thank you for showing me a Bible verse that I've never read before, as if I've never heard those words. But I am amazed how many uh, people think uh, that they can quote a Bible verse at me and suddenly turn my theology completely upside down. Oh, I never heard that before. I've been wrong for 30 years. Oh my gosh, I feel so terrible. Because it's just not so. The thing is, this by the way is the right translation. The word teaching, the word Torah in the Hebrew, uh, is exactly that. It is instruction. It's not about commandments and it's not about rules. It's about teaching, it's about guidance, it's about instruction. The problem is not that we don't know how to read the Bible. The problem is that we don't know how to hear the Bible. The problem is not that we don't know what the Bible says. The problem is that we think that that's all there is to it, is to just know what the Bible says. The problem is not that we don't know the words. The problem is that we don't know what the words are trying to do to us. At the heart of the challenge of our generation, as it was in every generation past, is for us again to recover what the word of God is and why we have it. And it falls on us as the church to be that voice in the world and to help the world find the answers to every generation's problems. Because the teaching of the Lord is perfect and the answers are right there. But we have to listen and we have to be open and we have to let it do its thing. So we read from Psalm 19 this morning, this lovely, beautiful Psalm. There are several 
uh, such psalms in the, in the Bible where they sing the praises of the word of God and, and of the teachings of God and of the commands of God. And, and in the process, there are all of these lovely truths there given to us to remind us of what the word actually is. Not the words are, but what the word is, capital W. And, and I thought it would be good for us this morning to just listen again to what the psalmist is telling us that we might again love and know and keep the word of God. So look again at the psalm and listen to what it said. The words rest are restoring to life. H how often do we hear the, the words of the Bible quoted in such a way as to condemn, as to destroy, as to, to, to harm people? How often are those words used to bring death, to put each other down, to close each other off? If we don't hear the words of the God in, of the word of God in such a way that it brings life, that it lifts people up, that it moves us forward, then, that, then we haven't heard the word of God at all. The word of God is a promise. It is a gift. It, it should make us happy. It should give us joy. It should, it should, it should fill our life and not be a tool to, to shut others off and condemn others and put them down. It makes the fool wise. Right? The, the word of God is expansive. It teaches us. That, that's why the word Torah means teaching. It was given to the Israelites, that given to us, that, that we might actually be better. It, it might open our eyes up to possibilities. It might help us learn things that we don't know. And, and, and far too often, far too often, we have treated the words of God as if it was just stuff carved in stone and this is it, this is all it goes, it goes no farther, period, end of sentence. Instead of being this invitation to, to explore and, and to grow and, and to progress, right? The, the word of God is, is to make us better. When, when too often it seems like what we really think the words of the Bible are there is to make people smaller, to make the world less. We can't do that. The word of God is a delight to the heart. We should be happy to read the word of God, and we should walk away from it filled with joy. Not filled with sorrow, not filled with anger, if you're quoting the Bible to put someone down, if you're quoting the Bible because you're angry or wanting to make someone else angry, if you're quoting the Bible to hurt someone's feelings, then you are not quoting the Word of God. You are not using the Word of God. It's not a weapon. It's barely a tool. It is instead a living spirit, the Word of God. And to hear it should lift people up and not drive people down. I fear that too often that's really kind of what we think it's there for. It's, a, it's either a sword or a shield, one of the two, but it is an instrument of warfare. And, and it's not a word of grace. Which always makes me wonder what we think of God then, that that's what we think his word is how small we think God is. We must think he's small because we make his words so small. When in fact he gives us th this incredible gift to help each other, to, to help ourselves. When, when, when times are difficult and, and man, isn't life hard enough that we should use, use the word of God to make it harder for people. That it should give light to the eyes. Right? Not, not darkness, not close people off, not shut people out or lock people in. And, and I think that may be the great tragedy of our generation, that, that, and maybe this has been the tragedy of every generation, I've only lived in this one, that, that we, we, we use this, this word to, to make people's lives harder and, and darker and make their paths more difficult to walk. We, we, we shut off opportunities and possibilities because the word of God won't allow that. 
When, when shouldn't the word of life, shouldn't the word of a resurrected Christ be this word that says there's tomorrow, there, there's possibility, you are alive, you could be something, you could do something. Not constantly can't, 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 can't. Not even should, 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 should. But can, 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 might. Maybe should after all. Maybe should live. Maybe that's what we should hear when we hear the word. Maybe that should be our, our, our test. Does this word tell me I should go and live? Or does this word tell me I should just curl up and die? Outlasting all time. The word comes to us from, from this distant past because that's when it was written. That's when it came to be. But the word should not be a prisoner of that distant past. God's word should be eternal. It should be for all time. Often when I, when I teach the Bible, I, I want to talk about the context in which it was originally written and in which it was originally heard because I think there's information there and clues there. And, and, and I think that, that understanding its original context is a, is a way that gives us some integrity in the way that we read and hear it. But the point of the word is that it creates a context now, right? That every time we hear it and every time we listen to it and every time we study and engage it, that it creates a context in our moment. And, and, and it, it's alive now, not just then. And, 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 and to be stuck in that word, and, and, and to be stuck in that mindset that says it has to be this way because it was always that way, is to mean that God has to be one way because he was always that way. And, and to turn the living God into a dead deity. But as God is alive, so his word is alive. And, and as God is meaningful and relevant in every generation, so his word must be meaningful and relevant in every generation too. Because while those words meant something in the moment in which they were first spoken, those words mean something now in the moment in which we read and engage them too. And, and we are responsible to understand those words in our time and in our place and in our lives and not just leave them dead as they were thousands of years ago. That's not enough. That's not enough. You know, one of the, the great verses in Leviticus uh, says that, that you should not wear clothes made of more than one fiber at a time. So, you know, you're, if you're wearing a polycotton blend this morning, you're doomed by the way you're condemned, according to the Word of God. Right? Of course not. Right? Of course not. <coughs> but that word meant something different then than it means now. And, and we are all smart enough to know that. We're all smart enough to understand that that word means something different in our context. And that means that we have some work to do to try to understand what that word means to us today. That, that we can't just take the easy road out and say, well, it meant what it meant then, it, means it must mean what it means now. No. It means we've got to work harder to make the word have meaning today. And one more. All of them are just. And there is that word, just. That word just, tzedakah, that word for righteousness, that word for justice, in the very biblical sense of the word, and if you have not heard me say this a thousand times, then hang on, I will say it a thousand times more. That word justice in the Bible has a very specific meaning. It is a word that God uses to describe his kingdom where the least are first and the first are last and where priority is always given to those to whom the world leaves behind, the widow, the orphan, the alien, the stranger, the needy. 
where the rules are rigged to make sure that those who are needful are cared for by the whole of society. An upside down world according to our values. And the thing is, is that we have used the word of God to justify this world that we have created because we do not know what it actually says. If you think that the word of God suggests in any way that being wealthy is a good thing, that, well, there will always be poor and you just have to live with that, that we are not constantly responsible for one another and the well-being of those among us who are struggling the hardest, then you do not know what the Bible says. But the Bible is captive to the powers that tell us what it means. And we fail when we allow them to dictate its terms. The bulk of the law of God, the bulk of the Torah, is crystal clear about what justice is and how much God requires it of all of us. The word of the Lord is just. We are not which is as good of a sign of any that we do not actually love the word of God. Though we pretend that we do, though we say that we do, if we don't live it, if we don't get it, then we won't have it. And we never will. It it is kind of amazing how this psalmist ends here. Not amazing, beautiful. That the word of God is is uh, finer than gold, more desired than gold, that it is sweeter than honey. I, I, I think that sometimes we, we look at the word of God and, and we want to ask that question, what's in this for me? What, what, how can I use this to make my life better, happier, fuller, richer, easier? The thing is, is that's not quite the point of the word of God. It is to make us better. It is to make our life richer and more full. It is to make our world a better place. But not for our sake. For God's sake. We've been given this amazing gift that that is the answer to the difficulties of our life. Not because our life should be easy, but that we should be good. There is this ancient question that that is always worth asking parents. What do you want for your children? Do you want them to be happy? Or do you want them to be good? And too often the answer to that question is I want them to be happy. What God wants for his children is for us to be good. What God wants for us is that we should be good. Because God knows that if we are good, then the rest will follow. Then the rest will follow. In Jesus' name, amen. The hymn, Lord Jesus, You Shall Be My Song, is number 808 in the red hymnal. Let's stand as we sing.
living together in trust and hope now let us confess our faith i believe in god the father almighty creator of heaven and earth i believe in jesus christ god's only son our lord who was conceived by the holy spirit born of the virgin mary suffered under pontius pilate was crucified died and was blended to the dead on the third day he rose from he into heaven he is seated at the right hand of the father and he will come to judge the living and the dead i believe in the holy spirit the holy catholic church the communion of saints the forgiveness of sins the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting amen let us pray for the whole people of god in jesus christ for the church and for those in need gracious and heavenly father we bless you for the gift of your word we pray that you would open our minds and our hearts to live in its beauty to know it in its fullness to study and hear it every single day that you would give us such love for your word that it would fill all our being lord in your mercy hear our prayer father help us to be open to all of its gifts to free us from all of our constraints free us from our agendas that we use to manipulate your word and to manipulate others let us know your word in truth let us preach it in its fullness let us proclaim it to all that everyone may know this living and beautiful gift you have given lord in your mercy hear our prayer and so oh father by your word move us out into the world that we might make a difference for all of our neighbors bring help to those who are troubled this day for those who are recovering from storms and disasters for those who are alone and afraid for those who are living in the midst of, of, of trouble and disaster for those who put their selves their well-being at stake for us grant O oh lord healing and wholeness in this world lord in your mercy hear our prayer father we pray today for our friends and neighbors who are in need and we remember those who are sick and those who are hospitalized and those who are recovering from surgery and those who are fighting against disease we pray O oh lord today for those who grieve that they might be uplifted by this promise of life we ask lord now that you would look upon all who we name here before you aloud and in our hearts lord in your mercy hear our prayer all of these prayers O oh lord we entrust to you because of the grace and the mercy that you have for us in jesus christ our lord and savior amen now the peace of the lord be with you all will you turn and wave and share a word of peace with those around you thank you please be seated as we pre prepare now to come for the meal again a reminder that you have options now as how you will receive the communion for those who are uh, worshiping on the stream uh, at home uh, obviously when we come to the uh, end of the communion liturgy there will be a time for you to share in the bread and wine yourself uh, for those who are here with us in person you may commune in your pews uh, if you picked up communion elements i hope coming in you will use those uh, if you did not uh, wave at the ushers and they will get them for you otherwise you may come forward at the designated time as well and receive the communion together in a continuous fashion let us prepare for the meal now as we sing let the vineyards be fruitful lord
Let's pray. God of abundance, you cause streams to break forth in the desert and manna to rain down from heaven. Accept the gifts you have first given us. Unite them with the offering of our lives to nourish the world you love so dearly. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. <clears throat> lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, Lord God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks to God. And he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this, he said, and remember me. And again, after supper, he took the cup and he gave thanks to God and he gave it to them to drink. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this, he said, and remember me. And so we pray together in the way he taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. If you are communing at home or will be communing in your pew this morning now, I invite you to share in this gift of God, beginning with the bread, as we hear these words, this is the body of Christ given for you. And the wine, this is the blood of Christ shed for you. I catch the sweet though far off hymn that hails a new creation. No 
storm can shake my inmost calm, while to that rock I'm clinging, since Christ is Lord of heaven and earth, how can I keep from singing? Through all the tumult and the strife, I hear that music ringing. It finds an echo in my soul. How can I keep from singing? No storm can shake my inmost calm, while to that rock I'm clinging. Since Christ is Lord of heaven and earth, how can I keep from singing? What joy through joys and comfort die, the Lord my Savior liveth. What though the darkness gather round, songs in the night he giveth. No storm can shake my inmost calm while to that rock I'm clinging. Since Christ is Lord of heaven and earth, how can I keep from singing? The peace of Christ makes fresh my heart, a fountain ever springing. All things are mine since I am his. How can I keep from singing? No storm can shake my inmost calm while to that rock I'm clinging. Since Christ is Lord of heaven and earth, how can I keep from singing? Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you always in his grace. Amen. Lord of life, in the gift of your body and blood, you turn the crumbs of our faith into a feast of salvation. Send us forth into the world with shouts of joy, bearing witness to the abundance of your love in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you with mercy and grace. The Lord look on you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Our closing, our closing hymn, the closing song, Holiness.
Thank you. Please be seated for just a moment. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> nice to have you back, John. Thanks. Well, good morning. Hope that you're doing good. Uh, <coughs> again, uh, <coughs> excuse me. A ah, little choked up there. Uh, again, uh, Sunday school uh, going forward, starting next Sunday, we're going to try to do kind of a live Zoom Sunday school, so please keep your eyes open for information about that. Uh, as well, and hopefully that'll meet the needs of our uh, families and our, our children who I know are in a really tricky spot right now. So whatever we can do to help with that. Uh, in the meantime, uh, our regular schedule goes on. The story, the Bible study, uh, Wednesday nights at 6. Um, we're going to continue to do that online on Facebook and the website for now. I really do look forward uh, to a day when we can also have people in person for that as well and i know that plans are now in the works for both choir practices and bell choir practices so uh, if you are part of or interested in being a part of either of those two groups um, get a hold of the respective directors and uh, find out what's going on anything else that's important for us to know today on the 12th okay so choir practice festival choir practice starts on the 12th of october that's very cool That'll be awesome. So two weeks, basically, a week and a half. Yeah, 10th, okay. Like I know calendars. Okay, anything else good? Thank you all so much. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.